Good afternoon. My name is Colonel Steve Henricks, and I was invited here today to share my thoughts and experiences on the rule of law missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of the lessons learned I can sum up to you in just a few lines. How do you know when you've offended an Iraq or an Afghan? The answer is uncomplicated. You will know because they will tell you. That simple answer we shall see tells us many things about the rule of law mission and reconstruction, including if we should really call what we do in this area reconstruction. Some Iraqis and Afghans may not necessarily agree that their countries need reconstructing. But before I get into the matter at hand, I need to provide what I call my drug company commercial moment. You know, when you see those couples walking on the beach or doing other fun things to the backdrop of both music and dire possible side effects. Luckily, I have no side effects and unfortunately no background music. But because I'm in the Army, I do have to provide the following disclaimer. The views I present are mine and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or any of its components. So with that out of the way, let's talk a bit about what I saw in Iraq and Afghanistan. The units I've worked with in those countries are the 5th Special Forces Group, the 101st Airborne Division, and the 10th Mountain Division. They are all what I would describe as units with a tactical mission. Thus, my experiences are at the ground level, a perspective that can provide useful information at all levels of decision making. 11 years ago in 2004, I served as legal counsel to the 5th Special Forces Group out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. For a seven month period that year, we were deployed to Iraq as the Combined Joint Special Forces Task Force, Arabian Peninsula, with our headquarters at Joint Base Balad, Iraq, which is about 50 to 60 miles north of Baghdad. We oversaw three battalions, including 10 to 12 man Special Forces teams throughout the Iraq countryside and throughout the cities. In early 2004 in Iraq, the U.S. military was flush with what it saw as easy victory, defined from our point of view at the time as removing Saddam Hussein from power, including his cronies, and preparing to deliver democracy to a people we were told were thirsty for. We did remove Saddam from power, but the rest of our goals in Iraq are still playing out. The military and other federal agencies planning to deliver democracy at that time in post-invasion Iraq seems almost hopeful now, especially in hindsight. Iraq at the turn of this century was not America as we know it was in the 1760s and the 1770s, which for the most part stood united in its outrage at Great Britain for imposing onerous laws and depriving the colonies of representative government. The peoples of Iraq, the Sunni, the Shia, the Kurds, and others instead focused their outrages at different things. And these outrages did not necessarily lend themselves to democracy. If anything, it seemed that these groups wanted to settle old grievances, they would jockey for power outside the ballot box, and they would have as little to do with each other as possible. While these fissures did not bode well for democracy in the short term, it did provide Iran an opening. I think we can all agree that country exploited to the fullest. And yet in early 2004, the U.S. military was just figuring out an insurgency was underway, as opposed to cleaning up a few pockets of Saddam holdouts. For most Army headquarters in Iraq, this meant we took cover in bunkers when insurgents fired rockets and mortars. We tried to look out for IEDs on the roadways. And the safe houses of the Special Forces troops would occasionally come under attack. It also meant Army units continued to generate and receive actionable intelligence, which led to orders to go out into the cities and to the countryside of Iraq to capture inspected insurgents. As 5th Group and many other military units prepared to deploy to Iraq in 2003 and 2004, we focused planning on these capture missions. Questions therefore quickly emerged about the legal limitations on these capture missions. Although authorized under U.S. law and United Nations directives and resolutions, what did Iraqi law have to say on the issue? And if it had something to say, was it even relevant? In early 2004, an interim constitution for Iraq was signed, requiring a transfer of power to a governing Iraqi body in the midsummer of 2004. 
This interim constitution put, a, put in place a warrant requirement before searching any Iraqi home. At the time, rumors flew around that the warrant requirement would apply to U.S. troops. Knowing that the U.S. military loves to train, fifth group units quickly came to me with two questions. One, how could they get an Iraqi warrant? And two, does getting a warrant mean they would also have to process a crime scene? Could this be right, I wondered? Would four military troops in Iraq have to track down an Iraqi magistrate, complete affidavits to support probable cause, and turn these capture missions into police raids with arrest warrants? One area of tension, I quickly learned, was no one knew for sure what the rules were. And perhaps that's to be expected in the very fluid environment that was Iraq post-invasion in 2003 and 2004. It turned out we didn't need to get warrants, at least in 2004. But these capture missions did take on an air of a police action because of what else our soldiers needed to do. Process the points of capture as if they were crime scenes. To gather information, not only for exploitable intelligence, but perhaps just as importantly, for evidence in court. These capture missions produced capture sites, which in a real sense required handling as a crime scene. In other words, to figure out how to keep the bad guys behind bars, we had to quickly figure out what the Iraqi courts would accept and require for admissible evidence and convictions. I came to learn we should group this evidence into three categories. First, the testimony of those making the capture. Second, pictures of any contraband seized. Think of weapons caches, for example. And third, biometrics and other scientific evidence, like the results of chemical tests that would show trace amounts of materials used to construct IEDs. So fifth group and other military units, including Iraqi units, would receive or generate a mission to capture an identified bad guy. Where would this bad guy go once captured? First to a coalition detention site, and then for trial by the Central Criminal Court of Iraq. The CCCI was an inquisitorial court and not adversarial. The judges and prosecutors I saw were Iraqis supported by coalition forces in various federal agencies like the FBI and the Department of Justice and the Department of State. For trial of those captured, if we were still in country, our higher headquarters would send us an order to produce witnesses in Baghdad and travel to court in the Green Zone. If we had left country, testimony would take place via a VTC system. If necessary, testifying witnesses would use an alias. What were the tensions I observed in this system of capture, detain, and then trial? First, a tension in the system itself. The process I just described usually results in a finding of guilty and lengthy jail time. But what if something else happened, like a finding of not guilty or minimal jail time? Unfairly or not, commanders and troops start to lose faith in the system with such results. Such results produce speculation that a judge might sympathize with a bad guy's or a bad guy's family, or that the judge feared kidnapping or worse. Or maybe the CCCI got it right with an acquittal or a light sentence. Suspicion, however, would set in and take hold. It comes as no surprise to us that those doing the capturing might not like a court disagreeing with them. Commanders and troops closely follow court results, as they should, because they are the ones who are dealing with the alleged insurgents. And they were always especially sensitive to light results from these courts. I therefore found myself having to manage expectations, and not always successfully. I came to conclude that this expectation management, it's healthy when the court is independent, it's not healthy when the court is fixed, and an occasional aberrant result does not necessarily provide us insight into whether that judicial system is healthy or not. That should be part of pre-deployment planning and training that takes place at Fort Campbell and other home units for troops. Learning such lessons should not occur in country after an unpopular CCCI result, for by then, minds may already be made up against the fledgling court system. Another tension that became obvious over time lies with the Iraqi people, kicking in doors, taking someone away in the middle of the night, and staying in prison for a number of years may not endear us 
to the local population. When you capture insurgents that most of the population may not like much anyway, we must not lose sight that it still may be viewed as one of theirs, and that person is being taken. The U.S. military, in fact, recognized this tension, and General Petraeus and the U.S. Army revamped its counterinsurgency doctrine to try to take this phenomenon into account, basically putting the focus on protecting the Iraqi people in a counterinsurgency. Between the two tensions I just discussed, involving our troops and the Iraqi justice system, and the Iraqi people and their justice system, what is a common theme? To me, it seems the answer is a potential lack of trust, a lack of trust that the rule of law has not taken hold. General Michael Oates is now retired. He's been a general with the 101st Airborne Division and the 10th Mountain Division, and he has seen combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He gives a very workable definition of the end goal of a rule of law mission. We achieve success, he says, when the people of an area voluntarily pay their taxes. By that measurement, I think General Oates means the rule of law's goal is to get a supermajority of the people to trust their government. That is, to trust that the government follows the law and tries to do right by the people. Even ISIL and other insurgents recognize this, as we've all read reports recently and even in the past, that insurgents try to emphasize providing government-like services to the towns and cities under their control. General Oates and most commanders, I think, look for the rule of law and by extension, reconstruction missions to produce trust. At the end, that's what they're looking for. Yet the tension I saw in my first deployment worked to defeat this goal. That leads to my second deployment, which was to Iraq in 2006, where I served with the 101st Airborne Division. We were headquarters at Contingency Operating Base Spiker outside of Tikrit in northern Iraq, an area that fell under ISIL control in 2014. I'll discuss three vignettes from that time that bear on today's topic. First, my meeting with Iraqi prosecutors. Second, certification of an Iraqi army division. And three, Colonel Michael Steele, commander of time of the 101st 3rd Brigade, the Rockets In the spring of 2006, I met with a large group of Iraqi prosecutors. The meeting was, in, meeting was in fact a conference with Iraqi prosecutors from throughout the country. I was asked to say a few words to this group about prosecuting cases. I don't know if any of you have had the experience of making a presentation through an interpreter, but it's an interesting time because you have a chance when the translation is taking place to look around and think and see what's going on. And this is what I saw, a group that was politely listening to what I had to say about the nuts and bolts of prosecuting, but something else was going on. Something was troubling them. At the end of my presentation, several hands went up and they all had the same question. Not about the rules of evidence, or procedural rules, or other tools of a litigator's trade. Their common question was much more basic and heartbreaking. When would they be paid? For God and country only goes so far. At that time in 2006 in Iraq, various groups and individuals jockeyed for power in the Iraq federal government. Perhaps taking a lesson from our own Congress, individuals would engage in the Iraqi version of the government shutdown as part of a larger power play. For example, some would hold out pay of the Iraqi soldiers and prosecutors to hopefully get concessions for what they wanted. I suppose it depends on your perspective of whether this constitutes hardball and sharp elbow politics or corruption. At some point, however, the U.S. realized it had to break this loggerhead and it tried to come up with ways for the U.S. to pay the salaries of these soldiers and prosecutors to avoid so much hard work and sacrifice going to waste. Of course, I had no way to provide a satisfactory answer to these Iraqi prosecutors as I stood there. I had no way to pay them, no way to authorize payment of salaries, or to even guess when they would be paid. In all respects, I was like the pitchman for the Heineken beer commercials. Someone will hopefully pay you, but it won't be me for the 101st. Of course, not being paid creates an obvious and possibly insurmountable tension in the rule of law mission. Eventually, one has to do something to put bread on the table. From what I could tell, 
all in attendance wanted to do the right thing. Like they say in the intro to Law and Order, they wanted to be the prosecutors that represented the people. In Iraq, holding yourself out like that took courage. The bad guys would target prosecutors and their families. Not as often as the Iraqi police force was targeted, but they were targets nonetheless. Here we had an important ingredient for establishing trust. Iraqi prosecutors from the local areas that could give faith in the rule of law by their sacrifices and the examples they set. Yet a combination of corruption and politics in Baghdad worked directly against that important ingredient of trust in the rule of law mission. When the Secretary of Defense at the time talked to patience for new democracies because they were messy, on the ground in Iraq, messiness produced a direct subversion of trust. This leads to my second vignette of the 101st. A primary mission for the U.S. military in Iraq was to train and teach the Iraqi army to fight and function as an army. In a still controversial decision, the Iraqi army was disbanded in 2003. Of the many consequences of this decision flowed the need to build up and leave Iraq with a new army. Part of that process involved the division staff of the 101st Airborne observing an Iraq division for a week to evaluate whether we could certify the staff and the division headquarters as ready to operate on their own. The Iraq division headquarters was in western Iraq, and going there gave me an opportunity to see the Iraq and the Iran border, and Iranian guards posted on that border. The Iraqi division had an old foe they could see and hopefully use as a motivation to excel, I thought. So I spent some days watching and interacting with an Iraqi army legal office. It was made up of several paralegals and two attorneys, one a young man and the other a senior lawyer, a distinguished looking older gentleman. Perhaps not surprisingly, the older attorney wanted no part of this certification. He realized he had to play ball somewhat, meaning he did not want to be responsible for his office not being certified, but he did so grudgingly. Towards the end of my time with this Iraqi legal office, the older attorney sought me out and engage me in conversation. And it quickly became clear he had a point to make. In very good English, he told me, you know, I've been an attorney for many, many years. I really don't require an evaluator, and I don't need a teacher. I didn't argue with him or point out that I had not told anyone how to do their job, and that I was just watching and really learning. Perhaps I should have told him that, but it was clear to me he didn't want to hear it and wouldn't have believed it anyway. My presence there, and what he thought I stood for, was an affront to him. An affront because he believed himself competent, and an affront for the arrogance he saw in my mission. His pride was wounded. And as we will see, such feelings are not unique to Iraq. For my last vignette with the 101st, I had the pleasure of serving with Colonel Michael Steele in 2006. Colonel now retired Steele is a charismatic, larger-than-life figure, a former football player at the University of Georgia who played on the offensive line. Steele was also a key figure in the book and movie Black Hawk Down by Mark Bowden. Standing six foot five, solid as a rock, Steele liked to wear a small patrol cap on his head uh, that I swear when he was in the Army combat uniform was three sizes too small. He favored taking his staff and commanders on long runs of at least five miles followed immediately by a round of combatives. By all accounts, Steele soldiers loved him, in part because he brought a steel resolve to fighting the enemy. As I mentioned, in 2004, we were figuring out Iraq was turning into a full-blown insurgency. In 2006, we knew that. Colonel Steele was an infantry commander looking to take the fight to the enemy. 2006 was also a time when the U.S. Army was reinvigorating its counterinsurgency doctrine and taking the fight to the enemy doesn't always square with that doctrine. Colonel Steele soon found himself accused of encouraging his troops to act too aggressively in Iraq's Iron Triangle, a very dangerous place to be in Iraq in 2006. I won't go into the details, but I do suggest that if you're interested, you read an excellent article about Colonel Steele and the soldiers under his command in the July 6, 2009 edition of The New Yorker called The Kill Company, which is available online. In sum, Colonel Steele received a reprimand for some of the soldiers under his command being too aggressive. 
ending his career and chances of further promotion. Now, during this time in 2006, a common complaint I heard from commanders and soldiers was that some Iraqi judges were on the take and letting bad guys go or go too soon. In fact, every time I deployed, I heard this complaint. Too many captured insurgents, it seemed, reappeared on the battlefield after being captured. I always wondered how that perception and constant source of complaint may have affected Colonel Steele's unit. This is what I mean by that question. And by analogy, I'll use a recent Law and Order rerun I watched. In it, Jack McCoy, a hard-nosed prosecutor, explained why we need the death penalty. One reason he gave to avoid vigilante justice. Now, I've studied a bit about the death penalty, yet it was the first time I'd heard that justification put forth in those stark of terms. When the system does not offer what some see as a necessary option, some will take matters into their own hands because of a loss of faith in the system. Could a tension like that have been at work in Iraq in 2006 for the troops in Colonel Steele's unit and other units? Would troops act more aggressively in their missions if they believe, rightly or wrongly, that the insurgents they catch will be right back on the battlefield in a few months because they mistrust the local criminal law system, and in essence, the rule of law? I suspect the answer to that question is possibly yes. And if the answer is yes or possibly yes, what does that mean? To me, it means several things, including it's just not the Iraqis or whatever country we happen to be in that need trained on rule of law missions. U.S. and coalition forces must also receive training on how our views of the rule of law can impact our attempt to counter an insurgency. In other words, Iraqis may resist the rule of law, that is, we don't need your help, they say, but we must also guard against our own troops losing faith in the rule of law mission, such that belief results in actions contrary to a successful counterinsurgency. The managing of expectations becomes a key element in how our military executes its orders. This leads to my Afghanistan experiences. In 2014, I deployed to Afghanistan with the 10th Mountain Division out of Fort Drum, which is just over an hour's drive north of here towards Watertown. We served in the eastern part of Afghanistan along the Pakistan border, the most violent part of that country. The Taliban and the poorest border with Pakistan were all alive and well there. I wondered how Afghanistan would be different from and similar to Iraq. It didn't take long before I had part of my answer. Within just a few days of putting my feet on the ground at Bagram Airfield, an old Soviet-built airfield in the Afghan mountains north of Kabul, commanders came to me livid about an allegedly corrupt Afghan prosecutor. The commanders were sure this prosecutor was a Taliban sympathizer based on his apparent reluctance to take some insurgent cases to trial, allowing some insurgent charges to be dismissed, and a lack of perceived overall zeal. And they wanted to know what their legal options were and how to remove this prosecutor. One option was to go to the Afghan Ministry of Justice and ask them to remove this Afghan prosecutor, which we did do. The prosecutor, however, came from a well-connected and influential Afghan family, and removal would not be quick if it would happen at all. Some things, perhaps many things, are the same the world over. Another option, submit a request to the Afghan army to target and seize the prosecutor and eventually have him charged with crimes. This option to treat the prosecutor as an insurgent in essence and capture him had many downsides. For example, being inept isn't necessarily proof of being an insurgent and we did not pursue that option. Don't forget though, that both our combat commanders and US and Afghan troops had all reached the conclusion that this prosecutor had become a danger through his inactions. And in that perspective was seen as a threat. In other words, some options that may not make sense to us immediately may make sense in a combat theater. A third option, which we did implement in the short term, was forum shopping to make this prosecutor obsolete. Afghanistan does have a relatively robust court system, which similar to Iraq, uses specialized courts that exercise jurisdiction over alleged insurgents. This specialized court turned out to be a good option. By all accounts, both our troops 
and the Afghan troops had faith in this court. Moreover, removing this prosecutor from the rule of law equation by going to another court of competent jurisdiction paid immediate morale dividends with Afghan and American troops. The system faced a problem in the form of a rogue prosecutor, and that perception had become reality on the ground. In this particular case, visibly removing the problem provided a source of faith in the system without a corresponding loss of faith by the Afghan people. In other words, the solution removed the motivation for Afghan troops or American troops or both to take matters into their own hands when dealing with suspected insurgents. But what of the Afghan Ministry of Justice? Did it ignore the problem? The answer, it turns out, is absolutely not. The Afghans used a long-term fix invoked and invoked a tried and true eternal solution to such problems. Promotion. The Ministry of Justice heard the American, NATO, and Afghan armies pleas for help and promoted this prosecutor to their office where they could keep an eye on him, ensure he caused no harm, and allowed his family to save face. In all respects, a tidy resolution to attention that may provide motivation for extrajudicial actions by soldiers in the Afghan police. In Afghanistan, we were just not removing questionable prosecutors in, in Afghanistan. We were also providing rule of law training. Just like Iraq, several federal agencies were present in Afghanistan, including representatives from the Department of Justice. These DOJ representatives contributed to the rule of law mission in various ways. In another of those prosecutors' conferences, DOJ hosted it and invited Afghan prosecutors from around the region and throughout Afghanistan to attend. The folks from DOJ put on a fine conference as there was much value in the topics covered for the prosecutors in attendance. I also had a strong feeling that I had seen all this before when another distinguished looking gentleman in the crowd raised his hand. The Afghan prosecutor had been listening politely as they all had been that day, just like the Iraqi prosecutors had done. Although the Afghanistans did have several sidebar conversations going on during the presentations. At the end of the DOJ presentation on the court system, the distinguished looking Afghan I mentioned looked around the room at his friends and his peers in the audience, raised his hand, and when called on, proceeded as follows. He asked, how long has the United States and the system of justice been in existence? Do you feel the beginnings of a trap being set? Or I did say <laughs> DOJ response. For over 200 years, the speaker answered, giving special emphasis to recent history, such as the Warren Court and its liberalizing decisions in the 1960s, giving us such thing as Miranda warnings. And DOJ also mentioned the Gettysburg Address, the Declaration of Independence, and the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The Afghan prosecutor, after hearing this answer and looking visibly unimpressed, he scanned the room for dramatic effect before responding. Your system of justice is only 200 years old. Our culture and system of justice have been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why would we, indeed, why should we, listen to a country that has been in existence for less than 300 years? What possibly could you have to teach us? And there you have it. Pride and resentment, again in response to perceived arrogance, or perhaps more subtly, annoyance at lack of demonstrating proper respect. A completely predictable reaction that the rule of law mission, and indeed any post-reconstruction mission, must take into account. In June of 2014, Afghanistan also had a presidential election. <clears throat> the mission as we saw it in the eastern portion of Afghanistan and, and as articulated by General Stephen Townsend at the time the commander of the 10th Mountain Division and Regional Command East was to assist the Afghans in producing an election that the Afghan people would accept. Note that this is not the same thing as a perfect election, if such a thing is even possible. On the day of the election, despite threats from the Taliban, to disrupt the election and fiery insurgency, the Afghan army, yes, the Afghan army, and not NATO or U.S. forces, provided tight security across the country. As an aside, this was possible 
because of the impressive planning and execution of the Afghan army that they executed in the days preceding the election. Importantly, the Afghan army saw it could rely on themselves as war fighters capable of besting the Taliban. NATO, U.S. forces, and the Taliban saw it too. Now, of course, in today's military missions, things are never so easy as just beating the enemy on the battlefield. The Afghan elections did, have, did not have much violence, but it did have its share of fraud allegations. The dead voters in Chicago past elections would have been proud with allegations of thousands of votes coming in from districts with only hundreds of voters. These fraud allegations at the time seemed to drown out the great job that the Afghans had done in allowing real voters to vote. I personally thought that the fraud allegations were a positive sign because if they were true, they showed someone cared enough to cheat. And if you care enough to cheat, that means you're trying to win. And that would eventually give some um, solace to the Afghan government. As for the election itself, however, the two sides eventually reached a compromise over the election's results, and a president and his cabinet were peacefully seated. While the press and others breathlessly reported on the fraud, it seems to me that the mission was met. The Afghans did receive an election they could and did accept. If that conclusion is correct, that must be an important step toward the successful rule of law and a reconstruction mission. An acceptable election should mean the Afghans generally trust their government, or at least the seeds are planted for that to take place. And that touches squarely on another issue in rule of law and reconstruction missions, what to do about fraud and corruption. In Iraq, we've discussed how hardball politics seemed to cross over to corruption such that soldiers and prosecutors were not getting paid, causing some to walk away from their jobs and giving the enemy, if not a victory, then cause to rejoice. Afghanistan, as we know, has its own corruption problems. By some measurements, it stands as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, because to get anything done requires payment of not just one, but several bribes. Sometimes it seemed to me that what we would call bribery, the local culture in Afghanistan viewed as nothing more than tipping. The area water plant presents a good example of Afghan corruption and the dilemmas that may arise from such corruption. The water plant sits right outside the Bagram airfield sharing a perimeter wall with that airfield. In fact, at one time before the plant's owners got on the wrong side of the U.S. law, the water plant was inside Bagram's walls and considered to be part of Bagram. I should note as a disclaimer, I did work on this issue at Bagram in 2014. At one time, two Afghan brothers owned and ran the water plant, but sold bottled water to a subcontract as a subcontractor to American and NATO forces. These brothers ran a variety of business services that catered to, catered to American needs, and unfortunately, eventually paid bribes solicited by United States National Guard soldiers involved in contracting on Bagram. The Department of Justice really wanted to make a case against the U.S. soldiers taking bribes, rightfully so. And to do so, the Department of Justice needed the brothers to make the case. DOJ therefore decided to trick the brothers into coming to the United States uh, under the pretense that they were going to receive an award for the great deeds they had done in Afghanistan. And once they touched down in Chicago, they arrested them and placed them in jail. DOJ then plea bargained with them uh, in order to obtain convictions against both them, they did minimal jail time, and also against the National Guard soldiers that had solicited the bribes to begin with. The brothers' company, which owned the water plant, was initially barred from doing any further business with the United States because of the brothers' legal troubles. The U.S. Army, however, probably realizing it needed a bottle of water from the plant, eventually reversed course and decided to allow the appointment of a trustee who was required to be outside the brothers' sphere of influence and who also would use new management at the water plant. This arrangement, the Army decided, would allow the water plant to continue to do business with the U.S. government. The trusteeship worked, and the water plant went back to providing bottled water to the U.S. military and NATO forces. Success, however, brought the attention of some in the Afghan government. Area alleges that, the Afghan, that an Afghan army general and some of his troops set up checkpoints just outside the water plant in order to collect payments from area's trucks to pass through, claiming that the water plant should not use Afghan land for free. 
The water plant and its management refused to pay this toll because if the payment was in fact a bribe, under the terms of the trusteeship, it could no longer do business with the United States. Given what happened to the brothers who owned the plant, not surprisingly, the trusteeship took such prohibition seriously. Area therefore refused to pay, and for a while it could not deliver its water and defaulted on its contractual obligations. Eventually, perhaps because of inquiries by the Wall Street Journal and the U.S. government, the general's checkpoints disappeared. Area remains leery, however, that the checkpoints will return as the United States presence continues to diminish in Afghanistan. Area also tried to do the right thing to solve their problem by offering to lease the land it's on directly from the Afghan government. I should note that when the plant was on Bagram, the company subleased land from the United States. Area, however, would not pay any bribes, not just at the checkpoints, but also within the Afghan government. And therefore, their legitimate business offers to the Afghan government could get no traction. Alternatively, Area also wanted to move back on the Bagram, but the U.S. made that option almost as difficult as dealing with the Afghans because of Area's subcontractor status made it difficult to negotiate directly with the United States. And the prime contractor didn't seem so eager for whatever reason to help one of its water plant subcontractors out of its predicament. When I left Bagram almost a year ago in November of 2014, None of this had been resolved. I'm not sure what to make of the area water plant predicament. Corruption within the United States National Guard contracting soldiers got it in trouble in the first place, and its refusal to engage in Afghan corruption wouldn't let it get out of trouble. I found myself often asking the following question. Should we be that concerned that area may have to pay some bribes to work in the Afghan system? In a country that some rank as the world's most corrupt, area could not get the Afghan government to consider its offer to lease land without the lubricant of working within the existing cultural norms requiring quid pro quo. I remember from long ago in law school that paying bribes in foreign countries could, under some circumstances, be a deductible business expense for the company's taxes. That rule may have changed since I took my tax courses. But at least at one time, our tax code and the Internal Revenue Service viewed foreign bribe paying as a sometimes necessary and acceptable expediency. For some reason, in Afghanistan a year ago, that seemed relevant to me. And what about area? Was area being too literal in its terms, the trusteeship, and simply putting on a moral front to get the United States and the Western countries and the Western media to help it out on the cheap? by having those sources exert pressure on the Afghans. As I had mentioned, both the U.S. government and the Wall Street Journal were making inquiries, and eventually that caused the general checkpoints to disappear. That, in turn, caused some consternation within the Afghan government. Or, Chatol roles seeking to extort and bribes as a necessary expense, outrageous as an affront to the rule of law. I think reasonable people can disagree about the lessons from the area water plant. But I believe area and many of the experiences I've discussed today teach us that we must view the rule of law through the lens of the local culture. It was, after all, Americans who solicited large bribes in the first place from the water plant. So perhaps the American and Western lens may not be the best viewpoint, and they are certainly not the only viewpoint. So there we have it, some vignettes from my time in Iraq and Afghanistan. The two common themes that I saw for one, a resentment amongst our local allies, sometimes going to outright rejection of our presence based on pride, ego, and a strong cultural identity. And two, corruption viewed as an affront to the rule of law. What should we make of these two problems? First, as I've already alluded to, at the level of the training and missions I was part of, it's not so much the rules put in place to help nurture the rule of law, it's the implementation that can cause both sides to not have faith in the local government and the rule of law that government produces. To help overcome this, training U.S. personnel on this phenomenon before deploying will start the valuable process of managing expectations. Insurgents are not held as prisoners of war until the end of hostilities. Instead, they are placed in a country's criminal justice system that, like ours, is not perfect. 
our dealings and interactions with these countries' criminal justice systems has the strong potential to give these systems strength. We must guard against overreacting to results we disagree with and distinguish between that and the actions of true poisonous actors. We must also avoid lecturing, de-lecturing, overseeing model with the host government players that I saw so much of in training on the rule of law. Instead, adopt a model that more fully integrates our efforts and the host country's efforts. Let the Iraqis and the Afghans teach most of the time and make sure pay is not an issue. Have funds ready to pay for this if necessary. And maybe calling what we do as reconstruction and a reconstruction mission puts us in the wrong frame of mind from the beginning. Those we are trying to help certainly see our reconstruction labeling and state of mind as presumptuous, off-putting, and therefore potentially alienating. Perhaps the better view is a less ambitious but more, more palatable position that we are there to help them take the lead in getting their country and its institutions back on the track they wanted. Not a reconstruction mission, but a restoration mission. As for corruption, I think back to General Townsend's wise mission statement for the 2014 Afghan election. Success is an election that produces results that the Afghans will accept. Likewise, any rule of law mission must produce an adherence to the rule of law that the local population will accept. For if they accept it, that plants the seeds of trusting it, and trusting it enough. And as evidenced, hopefully, by voluntarily paying taxes for the collective good. Eventually, these cultures may demand zero tolerance of such things like corruption, but to expect it from the start puts the cart before the horse by being counterproductive to gaining the trust in government necessary for all else to build upon. As President Obama once cautioned, in a different context, lest we get on our high horse. It's not so much that we have gotten on any horse, but that from the local actor's point of view, and those that we deal with, they often see us on that horse from the very start. Thank you for your time today. I've enjoyed it, and I hope my experiences may provide you some issues to contemplate that you may not have thought about. So thank you. And, uh, I saw no one had questions I was going through, but uh, I'm around uh, for a few minutes at least for any questions you may have right now. Yes? I have a, a bit of a technical question. Can you now, you spoke at length about expectation management strategies and how they were developed on the ground in the country rather than formally before. Yes. Um, was this the scenario with the NATO allied troops as well? Did they face similar issues? And were you able to build some sort of kind of cross, cross force of coordination to train them as well? Or did they have to go through separate training and procedural things? I found that the NATO forces typically followed our lead on such things. So it would require us to generate the training to begin with, and then they would follow it. Okay. Uh, and then hopefully, then if it took root, that it would then go back to the host country, so back in Europe and then the United States. Yes? I had a question stemming from my willful ignorance of the past court systems in Iraq and Afghanistan before we invaded. Um, did we completely restructure them when we came in, um, or did we kind of build off their pre existing? So when that lawyer comes to look out of practicing for years, um, was was he practicing within that same system, or did we kind of rebuild it in a different way? Uh, we I added. Just don't know. I, no, that's a, that's a great question, and I believe we added to what was already there. Okay. So, for example, that Central Criminal Court of Iraq, that was something new that we came in right. and helped set up as we transitioned from an occupation into their constitutional form of government, um, and that was one of the courts that could deal with insurgents. But they also had local courts throughout the country, um, but typically for the insurgents in Iraq. They were, they were funneled to the CCCI. Uh, Afghanistan was a little bit different. Uh, I really can't explain why they were different. Um, but sometimes these surgeons were tried by uh, more of the local courts. And other times, as I talked about, uh, they were funneled in towards this other central court that dealt with the service. Yes? Thank you for serving for Afghanistan. I'm from Afghanistan originally. And based on the civil reports, the United States spent about a billion dollars for promotion of Afghanistan. 
But I think the achievement in the snow that he there is the major evidence from people and on the ground. So I think Samarkand feels that I mean it wasn't just the court and that kind of politicians who show sympathy for the Taliban and war criminals, but in some cases the international community also takes side into these war criminals from background and one time I mean presence. So this is something that both goal of war and promotion of goal of war and both of them third country. Well I agree it's a very, very tough point. Yeah. I try to to, to to reference that in my presentation, which is that you have people, I guess it's not just from the Iraq and NATO side, but also the Afghans, who are upset about people who have been captured being released. Um, and then on the other hand, um, you can't get too upset about that because you have to understand that if it's part of the system, that you have to put your, it's better to put your faith into the system than an aberrant result. That's on the one side. The other side is you have a poisonous actor in place, and you do have to deal with that. The art and the trick is trying to figure out which side of that equation you're on. Do you have a true poisonous actor that's, that's doing bad things to the system and subverting the system, or do you need to let the system take its course? Uh, is that consistent with your point of view? Yeah. Yes? Hi, um, I, I think I understand a fair bit of, of the kind of operational side of, of your experience valuable for the conversation. I do think, though, there's a thread of cultural relativism in your arguments that are hard to sustain, um, especially in the case of Afghanistan. I think if um, any force that's doing rule of law reconstruction or rule of law supports, let's say, is trying to rely on a kind of a local cultural reference point, in Afghanistan at least, not as much in Iraq, but in Afghanistan, at least, that means hundreds of different regimes at stake because each of the local communities have their own rules, their own traditions, and their own laws. So in some ways, the kind of perspective of, of this kind of cultural specificity cuts against the grain of the, the universalism, or at least the, the federal nature of rule of law implementation of those laws. And I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are about that, if that was a tension that you faced, or if that's something you decided, you know, that's a structural issue that we just can't solve, or? I think part of it was a structural issue that was beyond a tactical unit being able to solve it. Um, I think it raises a great point. If you look at some of the rule of law predictions, for Afghanistan back uh, shortly after 9-11 in the 2001, 2002 timeframe. And you look at what some of the experts said about what you needed to do to establish the rule of law in Afghanistan. One of it was that it had a dormant court system for so long, they needed to try to get it back up. And of course, your point's well taken that the local culture, especially if it's so divergent, can't have the absolute upper hand. Um, but I think it's more of a, a matter of making sure it's properly calibrated that those local concerns are taken into account and you're not learning about them on the fly. And more, it's more important that you go in and anticipate um, what some of the cultural concerns could be so you're not caught by surprise by them. Uh, and then two, um, if you have a more inclusive approach to the system, as I talked about, not the lecturing overseeing model, because I did see a bonding going on. Now that was a good thing. I mean, all the Afghans seem to be having kind of fun with us as we're up there lecturing and talking about our great rule of law system in the United States, and they all seem to be, oh, okay, hitting each other and laughing and going, these guys have only been around two or 300 years. We've been around for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, uh, back to Alexander the Great. Um, what can they teach us? So in that sense, I thought that that's a good way uh, for bonding to take place. If they're bonding together by making fun of us, that's not necessarily bad. <laughs> Could, could not the British say that well, we've had a rule of law in place for a thousand years? <laughs> not, not to be the, facetious. The, the, but... Well, you know, the, the better answer from DOJ would have been going back, tracing the history back um, to, common law. to common law and also back to the Romans and also maybe perhaps tying in Alexander the Great. Well, then there, there are certain, and getting uh, an Afghan tie. There are certain aspects of common law that would be held in common, you know, by many cultures. Yeah, 
So I, I don't fault DOJ. Sometimes you can't come up with a perfect answer right away. But the Afghans are ready to pounce on that answer. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I think that's that. Anything else? All right, well, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Well,